Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you for joining us for one of our talks today. Today, we're joined by the wonderful Brooke Butler to talk all about her latest film, Lanterns Lane. And I was I was interested first in in what your character development process really looks like. And when you first got the scripts for this project, how you really looked at what's the foundation of this character and then where you really wanted to start by filling in a lot of the gaps and a lot of the further information and backstory for her. Right. Well, I think when I first sat down and did my first read through the script, there's a part of me that judged Layla because I was always someone that you know, shied away from mean girls or the mean girl behavior. Um, and Lalo is someone who was, you know, maybe a mean girl in high school. And then she went away, went left for the big city and she did evolve and she did change, which I think is very human. I think all people have the ability to change. But then when she comes back to this small town, everyone expects her to still be that girl and wants to get back at her for that. And so she has to face all of these people who she used to be all these fears along with a lot of other real fears that accumulate and so i wanted to see this arc of this girl that had to face this go through it all and where she ended up at, at the end and which i think is strong um and i then once i realized it's so human for everyone to make mistakes everyone on this planet does and sometimes we do pay for them and that's the human element of Layla that I wanted wanted to show and wanted to bring is that people can change and you know we can't always look at them through the filter that we remember in high school and who are they now and you know what what can they bring and so that was like one of my main arcs that I wanted to bring with her. And with that in mind, did it almost feel like you were developing her as two different characters within the film because you're really creating this idea and the script gives little details about who she was in high school and there's little right. inflections of how she treated people back in the day. Right. And then, like you said, there's that journey and that time that she spent away and really trying to evolve and come, become someone different. So for you, were there almost two facets of who this character was in the way that you developed her as well? Sure, of course, because I had to say, okay, what creates a person who is that way in high school? And that usually is pain. That uh, in, you know, in my experience of, you know, knowing people like this, it's, they usually have pain that they're dealing with and it's projected out on the other people. So I was like, okay, she had to be someone who when had to leave her small town, get away from her family, her home life, to be able to discover who she really is. And so now she's coming back into this world that expects her to be that person. And she's like, ah, I, I'm so used to being that person around these people, but I'm not that person anymore. I've healed and I don't want to be. And so she you knows she has to face the consequences of her actions, which is again, so human. At least she's it taking them. <laughs> There's, there's different layers and ways that we explore her as a character as well. At the beginning, you know, she's almost still very withholding with people around her because these are people that she hasn't seen in a long time. And she also proactively has chosen not to engage with them as friends anymore. Right. And then she's coming back and, and trying not to fully slip back into everything. And so did you find that there was, there was an interesting approach in really figuring out at how, when and where she was going to gradually allow herself to open up and show those fallibilities and vulnerabilities and and kind of dealing with her past in a different way throughout the film. Of course, I think she has an extraordinary amount of shame um, and embarrassment. Um, and there are um, there's a moment that she has this conversation with Missy. Um, and part of my process is like Missy and Layla don't really exist. Correct, like uh, Brooke exists, and in this case, Ashley Doris exists, who was playing Missy. So I really wanted to have a deep connection with Ashley as a human being. And so we would go to lunch, and I would ask her all about herself and get to know who she is and what makes her tick, because that's how I'm going to push her buttons, and that's how I'm going to actually affect her to get a genuine response while we're filming. And I remember she told me something extremely private. And I said, uh, do I have your permission to use this while we're filming? Because it was a, a very, very private dark thing that she had been through and she said, yes. And so we were having a, you know, kind of 
friend face off moment and we weren't really getting there. And I went up and whispered into her ear and it just made her so pissed at me, which is something Layla would have done to Missy is piss her off. And she started crying and then like the scene just took off and I was like, somebody roll, somebody roll. Um, so for me, it's also just getting to know like genuinely who I am with as, you know, who is Andy, who is Ashley, who is Sydney as, people because that's who really exists and how we how we interact and luckily during COVID we were so shut down that it's really just the four of us spending so much time together and we were able to develop such camaraderie and chemistry that I think that lent itself to this group of old friends you know being trapped in this house Terry and Tara rides together. <laughs> but the idea of old friends is explored in such an interesting way because there is that history and there is the fact, especially with the characters Layla and Missy, that they were incredibly close at one point. But these are people who haven't seen each other. I think like there's a there's reference to like it's been at least over two the last two years. So it's been a while yeah, since they've been God. in the same space. <laughs> so there's both that intrinsic familiarity that you have with someone and that moment of you know, they don't really know who they are in this moment, in this space and time. And particularly with the age that they're at, they've both had a lot of growth. And so what was that journey with all of the characters that Layla is re-encountering of figuring out where there was the familiarity, but also where the distance laid between them? Right. And I, and again, I think everyone can relate to, there's something precious about your teenage years that really develop you into who you are going to be and do affect you for the rest of your life. I think every person here could say, oh, I remember this one moment from high school that changed the trajectory of my life and now the filter at which I look through life at. And I think Layla was someone who was the only one that left her small town and was able to heal that filter. And so when she comes back in, she's faced with it all again. And so it, it's almost like a brand new relationship between Missy and Layla all over again and I think Missy still stayed this small town girl who's working at the bar has you know I haven't done anything and then I come back and you know Andy's character has grown up in this handsome man it's kind of like oh you know I never I remember you being like a nerd and then you know there's chemistry there again and and then also dealing with um Shana who was whose older sister I was mean to who ended up killing herself. And um, the fact that I had to deal with the pain and the shame that words that I said may have caused that. And, and I hope that it's also a warning that if anyone's young and watching this, like kindness is everything how you treat other people is everything because it will haunt you for the rest of your life. And because she has to face that reality and face the consequences of her actions in the past, did you find that for her as a character, that was quite an internalized part of the process? Because, you know, there's moments where they discuss it in the film, but it's also that's kind of a lot of the underlying moments even outside of that. And so was it a real internalized exploration of the character and really figuring out how she was going to continue reconciling and facing this? Of course, I think at first she's like, I'm just going to come back, say hi to everyone, sweep this under the rug and run back to the city. And then, you know, that can't happen because everyone's like, come on, let's go to Lana's Lane. Let's do this. Let's do that. And then she's forced to face all of that. And then when we start being terrorized you know by we don't we don't know what's out there I have to redeem myself by trying to protect Missy and that is my entire arc it's like okay yeah I was a real crummy friend I completely left you I completely was selfish and did my own thing this is my redemption moment to like take care of you and show you that I've always loved you yeah. Which is a real evolution from how we see them at the beginning, even when they're first re-encountering each other. There's a moment where they're talking and Missy even kind of like hugs Layla as she's saying something. And, you know, you and your performance just kind of sit there very still. Was it important to you that she be very physically withholding as well as emotionally at the beginning? Oh, completely. It's, it's all, it's, it's everything. I mean, it's, 
to have that arc, it has to be physical. It has to be mental. It, it has to be emotional. It has to be everything. And what changes that is the, is the situation that they're going through without me saying too much. It, it's like, okay, I can't just sweep this under the rug. Now we're in like a life or death situation. And now I'm going to have to show everyone who I really am and what I care about. And it's, it's such an interesting track to get to take a character, develop them, figure out who they are, and then to put them in something that, as you said, is literally a life or death situation and the worst thing that's ever happened to them. And then to figure out who they're going to become. Right. And were the, did the scripts kind of make it fairly straightforward for you to understand and figure out what her actions and what her response is, whether it was going to be fear, whether it was going to be strength at different beats, or, or was that a real arc of discovery as you were filming a lot of the scenes? Right. Um... I will actually give credit to our writer and director um, for he didn't put that in. It was just like, they walked to the door, they were, you know, and, and I, I, as an actor, love that because I'll sometimes go through a script and I'll erase notes and I'll erase punctuation marks because I don't think you can plan that. I, I think, I think I, I go in knowing what filter I'm looking at life through like who I am, where I'm coming from, how I feel about every person, but then I don't know what that person's going to give me. And so depending upon what that person gives me, it could change, it could change everything. And I always want everything I do to feel authentic. So like, even, you know, maybe I didn't get any sleep last night and I'm more terrified today than I, you know, and in finding where like those those moments fall, it, it's, it, each take can be slightly different depending on what feels authentic in that moment and, and what memory I'm using or um, what sense I'm smelling or tasting or seeing, or it just has to come from truth. And so I don't know how to answer that question other than it, I knew who I was going in and then didn't plan from there because I wanted it to feel real. No, I think that's the perfect way to do it. Are there any particular scenes or moments in the film that you remember were such a moment of discovery in the moment of filming it based on what your scene partner was giving you? Oh, of course. Um, that scene between me and Ashley. And then I think also um, some of the scenes between me and Andy because we actually have become like best friends. We like talk about acting together every single day now. And you could feel that like relationship building, which then we are like, oh, it'd be interesting if like we show the build of like, is there a romantic relationship here with our characters? And um, I think every scene that we had together, even though a few times we burst out laughing and had to call cut. <laughs> but I, I just think we could like feel those connections. I don't want to give too much away by like saying what the scene is. But I think there's a moment where I decide to leave the house and we just stare at each other. And like we talked through that whole moment, Andy and I did and what that, there's no words, but what that like meant, because it's like, has he, has he always been in love with Layla and he, is he letting her go do this? And will he never get to see her again? And am I like seeing him with fresh eyes for the very first time being like, oh crap, maybe it's always been this guy, but now I gotta go out and to defend our lives you know i'm trying to not give away too much but yeah it's a, it's a delicate dance to try and play with yeah <laughs> like my brain is like can't say that, can't say that. <laughs> and in working with with justin as a director did you have much opportunity to talk with him about character and about certain choices before you went into filming or was it more about having conversations as you were workshopping scenes in production he's extremely collaborative and we talked a lot before we even got there because you know it wasn't indie we know our time was going to be quick we didn't we got one or two takes sometimes maybe sometimes just one and move on and um so he really wanted to prep that ahead of time which i appreciate he wanted to know how i work and i was like i don't you know i want to do all that talking now so that when we're on set you can just come say two words to me and it triggers me so we're not wasting time sitting there being like well, I think she wore purple, but, you know, I, and so we ended up having that, that rapport and even every morning, which is night, because we film night shoots, so we'd get up at like 5 p.m. and, 
and Andy and I would go over the script and then everyone else would come and Justin would come. He was always available for us. Um, I would work for Justin any day of the week. I think he's extremely creative and extremely collaborative and extremely easy to work with. And anytime I was like, can I change this to that? And I feel and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, great. <laughs> so I appreciated that. And because you were bringing up there that obviously there wasn't very much time to do many takes and you had to really be able to just show up on set and jump straight into a scene and get it on the first take, not knowing if you were going to have another opportunity. Did you find that, you know, through the myriad of roles you've done, and if we look at something like Ozark, where you're stepping into an ecosystem that's already in motion and you really just have to step in, read the situation, find your character, find the beat and film a scene, that a lot of projects that you've done in that sort of realm actually really serve of a great purpose and culmination of skill sets and coming in and leading an independent film in this way a hundred percent I feel fully prepped for that I'm like uh, you know I'm like usually I can get it on the first take um but that's because I've done the work and I am someone who that's actually my very favorite part of all of it um and yeah doing these films and like knowing how to lead one and it's really prepared me and I feel like I'm just beginning and I feel like my journey hasn't even started and I'm excited to play grittier characters and dirty myself up and start heading in that direction. And with that idea of, of doing the work beforehand for you, what are the most important key components that no matter what the role or what the project is are always part of that process for you? Always an arc, but even if it's a, guest star that's got to start somewhere and go somewhere the filter at which i look through life and basically doing all of this work and creating even how i walk how i talk how how i think how i feel about every person i'm interacting with um and then taking all of that work and going bye and then showing up it's like and then seeing you know what happens <laughs> with that and with Layla, with everything that we've been talking about in terms of her backstory, these relationship dynamics and the situation that she's played in, with that journey of figuring out, okay, how does she walk? How does she talk? You know, how is she going to deliver dialogue? How am I going to deliver these lines? What was that journey of landing on those specific choices for her as a character for you? Well, I think Brooke would have reacted me as Brooke wouldn't have done all the same things <laughs> Layla did. So I had to find a way of like, what made her be someone that reacts this way? Like, trying to not give too much away. Like, there's even a moment where, you know, the the figure is coming to a door that she knows is unlocked, and she or like Layla sprints to it and locks it. Like, that's confidence and that's strength. Brooke might have been like, "You go do it," like, you know. On my, like, I like to think I would be more like Layla in that moment. But so she is someone that I went off, was on her own, knows how to be independent and is going to like stick up for those that she cares about. And so finding why she was like that and what made her that way and how she sees everyone and how she connects to everyone was really important. But again, also developing Brooke's relationship with Andy and Sydney and Ashley as real human beings is everything. The camera's also very intimately connected to Layla as a character, you know, to all of the characters, but Layla in particular. And we very much kind of follow her and see what she sees around a corner when she experiences and encounters it. And there's a lot of moments where the camera really stays with you as you're moving throughout the space. And so what did that look like in terms of working with Justin and figuring out a lot of the choreography and a lot of the blocking of scenes together? Right, we would walk through all of that before we started filming because I like, for me, once action is called or even before like the world disappears and it's just me and you know, who's ever in my scene with me. So I like always wanted that to be, okay, what are, where are we going here? So I kind of also like know where camera is and then can like, you know, clear the mechanism and be present. Um, within that moment and Justin was so great about that and adjusting and, and giving notes um, because it's an intimate private moment and it's it's moments where especially in the car later and um, I really thought I was alone 
And like the crew was so excellent in being like quiet and allowing me to have that. And I'm also someone that sometimes if it's a private moment, we'll like put earbuds in and go to a place in Brookshead or a memory in Brookshead of a time that she felt like that and then relive it, you know, as I'm going through my, through my emotions. <laughs> And the film, not fully, but almost entirely takes place in this one location once they go out to Lanterns Lane itself. And, re you know, Justin's really using every single space, every single corner inside, <laughs> outside. Like you said, even the car outside becomes a location. But did you find that there was a real, almost like immersive experience in performing and getting to, to come back to that same location every single day and particularly because of the way that he utilizes it visually on screen as well? He used the space, like, I, I don't think people are even going to realize, like, how small this little space was. And I feel like you never feel like you're in the same space, which is mind-blowing how he did that. Um, but for me, I would show up to set and go in, sit in the room and take in, like, you know, the trash on the ground. Like, was there something sticky on my shoe? Like, the smell of it, the look of it, how it made me feel, like, because it was like this dilapidated house. So it being like, does Brooke feel any presence here? Like, what are the things going on here so that I could use all of those layers, you know, as the chaos ensued and the cruise around, things were like happening that I could go back to like, oh, there's that like smell of like, there might be deadly mold in here. Like, you know, big different little, those little tiny things that maybe no one will notice, but like I did. And, it'll read in one way or another. And you were bringing up before that, you know, like a moment where she runs across the room and locks the door and that's a moment of strength, but there are moments where the fear is allowed to take over. And right. there's a lot of different directions and choices that you can make when playing an emotion like that. And so for you, where did you want it to channel from within her as a character when you were allowing the fear to come to the surface for her? Well, I am, method in the sense that I like to use like real memories sometimes but you know I, all the other times I'll create I, I have my own whole own process but really just putting myself there 100% and just seeing what comes up or sometimes you know I would be like if I wasn't feeling something in the moment I'd be like okay well my entire family is out there about to be murdered by this person and what would that feel like and really imagining that and the amount of emotions that come up when you think of someone that you love more than anything in the world being harmed is you go up and down you're pissed and then you're like terrified and you know and then you want to scream and then you want to hide because you're scared for yourself and then you're selfish and then you're so it's all over the board and I was just like well let's just see where which one of those things comes up when <laughs> <laughs> I feel like one of the moments that that kind of has that emotional all over the board for her um, without giving away too much is that there's a moment where she kind of thinks that maybe actually everything was a prank and then she realizes that it actually wasn't and right. so there's such a multitude of factors and processing that's going on within that right. scene right. and and so what was it like filming a scene like that and being able to go in so many different directions <laughs> So I'm like trying to think how to not give stuff away <laughs> in my brain. Um, I mean, I love that moment. It took a while to choreograph that moment, so it didn't look like Scooby Doo. Um, but I think we <laughs> we finally got it, and I just had to put my place in the place of real fear. And then you know, and people start laughing at me, like the fact that I didn't want to be there in the first place. That I have, I've created a lot of other stuff. Um, <laughs> I actually created at one point that Layla was pregnant. And so I imagine like if I was, which isn't part of the storyline, but I think at moments it helped me be like, I gotta get out of here to, because there's someone more important than me. Um, just using different like little tactics like that to trick my brain in, in different ways. But, you know, when you're in that much fear and you have that kind of level of protection going on within you and you see that people all think it's a joke, 
I don't laugh and piss you off. (laughs) And you were talking a little bit before about how coming on and leading a film like this is a real culmination of a lot of the other work that you've done in the past. And what what is that difference for you in stepping onto set in a project like this as the lead, as kind of the number one on the call sheet? Because at that point, it's not just about showing up in the performance that you give. It's also about setting the tone for the rest of the cast, the rest of the crew, and really being a central part of creating what that environment's going to be for everybody. 100%. You're you're the leader, but I believe in quiet leading. So it's things like, hey, everyone's getting up at five. Let's meet down in you know the little cafeteria of the hotel we were staying at, and let's run this 15 times. Stand up, walk around. Try to let's try to scream it. Let's try to do it with the British accents. Try to and you know having people be creative and asking them how they feel and getting to know them. Or you know we were getting the covid swabs that went up and touched our brain and made us bleed because it was so early on and you know it was when people were in fear of that taking them aside and you know making them feel supported and loved and like i know that sucked like but we need you on this film you know and it just you know i'm trying to be just a collaborator with everyone because i have been on sets where the number one has been awful not awful as an actor but just maybe in terms of collaborating or making you feel like it's not a team and it's about them. And that's how I never want to make people feel. I always want to make everyone feel important, even if they come on and they have three lines. Like I, I, they're still important. And there's a scene I have at the beginning with um, Braxton, who's my ex-boyfriend, my ex-boyfriend in the scene. And, and that actor, he's he's an extraordinary actor. He's a Shakespeare actor. And so even though we had this one little scene, like that's so important because we have history and we have in talking to him and getting to know who, who he was and working on that. And I just thinking basically kindness and making everyone feel like they're just as important, if not more important than me, because they are, because none of it happens without all of them. So it's like a family. Yeah. And overall, in reflecting on the experience of making this film, what do you feel like you came away learning from this character and this particular project within yourself? Well, we had such a wonderful crew and cast. Like, it's it's rare that there's not even like, you know, one little bad apple is like such a teamwork. Um, and I think I learned a lot of calmness listening and patience from Layla and that was being on that set in general with a lot going on having it be a smaller budget film out in the middle of nowhere um you know eating Applebee's every night you know (laughs) just like all those things but it made it so so wonderful I mean I don't know how much time we have but my favorite story is about the Moscow Arts Theater that was doing really successful under Stanislavski and then the New York Arts Theater that was not doing so well. And they were trying to figure out why because they were teaching the same method and the Moscow Arts Theater, I'm trying to make this quick, would say, oh, you know, we have to walk both ways in the snow and we don't get paid anything and we have a million lines and, you know, it's so hard, but we get to do what we love. And like, that's what makes our characters full of depth. And then the New, York, the New York theater was like, well, we have to walk in the snow both ways. And like, we're not getting paid and we can't pay our rent. Well, and it's just, it's all outlook. Like everything is outlook and like making everything the best experience possible. And that's what's going to create the best art. Yeah, I really love that outlook and congratulations <laughs> on everything with the film. And thank you so much, Brooke. Oh, thank you so much.